Hello and welcome back to the Tonic Accord podcast. Uh, this week we will be diving into the impeachment hearings that happened over the last week. Um, what that means, how the public has responded, and uh, what that may look like going forward. Um, and then uh, we have a couple other topics to discuss as well if we, if we happen to have the time, such as uh, what's going on in Bolivia with Evo Morales. But we'll see if we get there. Um, what's up, Alex? How you doing, man? Hey, Drew. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, pretty tired. Had a busy weekend. Uh, you know, just I'm, I'm enjoying Madrid, but at the same time, I'm, I'm starting to think about getting home within the next year and doing some other stuff. So it's kind of a bittersweet year trying to, you know, take advantage of Madrid and start planning other stuff. So, yeah, busy, busy. How about you? Yeah, same here. Lots of um, lots of stuff to do. I mean, I've, I've been uh, working pretty hard at work, but then also trying to enjoy my weekends and going out and stuff. So. A lot of good stuff, a lot of tiring stuff, but but the politics always rolls on. <laughs> yeah, I was listening to uh, just the Economist podcast earlier today, hoping to maybe hear about world affairs instead of what's happening in the United States. And of course, it did a full circle back to the impeachment. Everything I heard, even on a, even in the in Europe and I don't know uh, Britain, everything is still kind of talking about this impeachment stuff right now. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's it's definitely a soap opera uh, and a half. <laughs> um, it's it is kind of crazy. I mean, I think I think regardless of anyone's position on what's happening, it's definitely historic, right? It's it's not something that happens often. It's only happened a few times, and now that we live in a world where it's so much media and it's so quick, I mean, you're basically watching a soap opera in real time. Yeah. That's that's a very good point, you know, and I I don't know if I trust the merits on it, but it, it was funny when Devin Nunes concluded in day one. I remember he said that all this is, you know, is the part two of the Russia hoax. It's just, uh, you know, a, a, a scene from um, the, you know, the second installation of the series. And I'm going first off, I think that's, you know, total BS. But but it is funny to think that. Uh, this one to me almost feels like kind of a cheap B grade version of a uh, of the Russia the first Russian investigation now. Yeah, it definitely does feel like a, a season two. I uh, know Devin <laughs> Devin Nunez used that rhetoric for his own reasons, but uh, no, it definitely does feel like here here we go again kind of thing. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, like to me, I, I've been asked so many times by Spanish people and some of my British friends over the last couple days you know oh so what do you think about this whole impeachment thing and i guess i've had a lot of time to really uh manufacture my response just because so many people have been asking but it's like i i don't know about you but i feel like these two first days of the impeachment inquiry to me feel like a tale of two stories you know depending on where you've received your information mm -hmm. like republicans have called it a boring affair with no new revelations and a lot of hearsay evidence but then democrats have called it Bomb, a bombshell, which shows new direct evidence of impeachable offenses. They've escalated their rhetoric, talking now about extortion and bribery instead of just a quid pro quo in the most simplest form. And, you know, it's, it's getting interesting. And I, I actually think two things can be true at once, talking about how these two hearings could have been boring, but also did have some relevant information, you know. Right. And well, and, and so it, two things are definitely true, right? So first off, the, the Republican thing of it's hearsay. Yeah, some of this is here is would be considered hearsay in a court of law, but that's not where we are current currently. Um, you know, that would be more that would be more if the things go into the Senate. It's a more, more way more formal kind of court proceeding. But this right. is just, this is just impeachment hearings. So yeah, when you have someone like um, you know Taylor saying, "Oh, I overheard a phone call." Yeah, that 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 is hearsay. That doesn't mean it still shouldn't be at least like looked into. Um, and then on top of that, I also think the same reason on the same thing that I don't think there's been any huge bombshells from the Democratic side. And especially since the bombshell that everyone is talking about is someone overhearing a phone call. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I don't know if that's really a bombshell. Um, so I definitely do think that it's like, you know, obviously Democrats are going to hype this up as, you know, this is the we got we got them. And then Republicans are going to brush it off as, you know, nothing new. This is another ploy. I think it is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I, I think that's very well said, you know, and I I think you're right is that nothing, nothing just circumstantially game changing came out of this, you know, and 
And to me, especially day one, which had Kent and Taylor, to me seemed like more of a formality than anything because um, Taylor had already spoken quite fully, you know, in, in a closed session. And so to me now it seemed more like getting him out in the open to say a lot of the same things he'd already said, but it was better for transparency, you know? Right. And it still always looks good having a man with his credentials speaking about his fear of where our diplomacy is going, you know? And I think he did raise some serious concerns, but it does come back to how credible is what he said. And I believe him, but at the same time, I don't think you're going to change any Republicans on this by what is truly by definition, a hearsay evidence, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's the, I mean, you know, we talked about this off a podcast, but the reality is, is, um, you know, like a lot of this is optics and, and looking for, towards the election. Um, so like, I, I th- like, like you said, like not much new really has come out except for maybe overhearing one phone call, which is hearsay. Um, so not much new has come out, but it's the idea of putting well, like well-respected, credible, um, long time, uh, net, like international policy guys up on the stage to, you know, be professional and credible. Because they've mm-hmm. already said all their stuff behind closed doors, and now it's just now now it's the TV portion. Now it's the soap opera, right? Um, so it is it is it is interesting to see um, you know these guys talk about how you know never in their entire careers had they seen this kind of dealings and this kind of back channels, right? Like you know that's the one thing that I noticed with the Taylor and Kent thing earlier in the week was how. You know, someone asked, well, we do quid pro quos all the time in international policy. And he's like, yeah, we do, but not for like personal gain through a back channel and an irregular channel of diplomacy. We do it through regular channels to promote established public, um, you know, national interests, like things that we all agree are in the national interest. Mm-hmm. So it was it was interesting to hear that and have the clarification because because, you know. What was it? Um, Mulvaney a couple of weeks ago made that argument that, oh, well, we do quid pro quos all the time in diplomacy. And it was good to hear that from a professional that, no, there is a difference between what we usually do and what has been done uh, earlier this year in Ukraine. Uh, that's a very good point, you know, uh, and it's I think it is something that that needs to be addressed. And I'm, I'm glad you said it is that. Yes, quid pro quos seem to be kind of a staple of diplomacy to a certain extent. You know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. We give you aid here, you give us weapons here. I mean, I think it's just how global dynamics work. But like you said, the the unprofessional, just backwoods, back sorry, back channel ways that this happened um, do raise some concern. You know, but what I'm worried about here is that this whole impeachment inquiry seems that if it's not done correctly, might just go into the weeds on this because I'm just worried that is this an abstract foreign policy debate that is being turned into an impeachment inquiry? Because without us right now knowing Trump's true intent, like obviously people have testified believing his intent and Republicans have defended his intent. But I find that Trump is a very hard person to pin down on intent because that's how he runs his politics is kind of a lack of plan, a lack of you know, strategic maneuvering. And so I'm just worried that if they can't prove his intent, then it's going to be very difficult to actually say that he was doing this on a personal level, you know, because it's clear that the Ukraine does have corruption. And so if he was smart and stayed off Twitter and could bite his tongue, and if Mick Mulvaney could also bite his tongue, part of me feels that they could potentially calm this down and kind of point it as just an abstract debate over what do we do with diplomacy in that part of the world? Yeah. I mean, I think, (laughs) yeah, I mean, he could, I mean, I've heard that argument, right? That he's trying to go against corruption in Ukraine and that, and, and so, you know, it was all part of diplomacy and policy. But what, what, what gets me away from that is when he was on TV and he said that China and others should look into Hunter Biden that to me shows that it's pretty obvious he wants to target the Bidens, and yeah. um, you know, I don't know. That's just my also my kind of my gut feeling is that Trump doesn't really care about corruption. <laughs> Frankly, <laughs> um, you know, considering he he's most he's most friendly with some of the most corrupt leaders in the world. Yeah, um, but you know, I don't I don't know. Like it, it it's I I I personally think that it was all to get um, dirt on the Bidens and Hunter Biden and use it um, 
or or also push the narrative that Ukraine helped the Democrats in the 2016 election to turn to make people forget about Russian meddling. Um, right. But I mean, yeah, it, it, but it, right, like it, it is going to come down to like public perception and, and your point about getting in the weeds, because, again, you know, we say this every week that we talk about this. He's not going to get impeached in the Senate. So it is going to it's a public it's a public perception battle. Um, and, you know, right now, I think the Democrats have the public perception in their favor, but that may not always be the case. And it's really close. Uh, in fact, if you want to if you wanted to mention the statistics you pulled up earlier and take a look at those, I'll, I'll let you go through them. But, yeah, it's changing, but it's not going to be that way forever. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll pull that up real quick because it actually is a pretty interesting uh, poll uh, from 538 who usually, in my opinion, are pretty trustworthy in their in their um, polling. They usually seem to come out with some pretty pretty accurate things. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting just looking at the main graph. Uh, I don't know if you have it in front of you. I do. Right now I, as I do. Well. I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, it. I mean, basically, what what we're looking at is that it is true that basically the support and the um, non-support for impeachment. Uh, seem to kind of be teetering back and forth and inversely related, where you'll see after the Mueller report, uh, impeachment actually, shockingly, let me see here, looking at the colors, you actually see pretty much an inverse reaction in every way possible. So when Trump does something bad, um, popularity for impeachment seems to go up amongst those that support it and seems to go down with those that don't. And during a more moderate sense of time, it looks like the opposite occurs where it just kind of stagnates, where you pretty much have about 48% supporting it and about 46 not supporting it. Yeah, for, so 48 and 46 is pretty close, and that's within the margin of error. So yeah. it's I would, you know, if you had to include the margin of error and everything, it's probably about dead even. Right. Um, and again, you know, there is a big increase, and this is the first time where the Democrats have really had, like, a, a, a small majority of support for impeachment. And I think that's why they're going forward with this again. You, you know, you can see how there's definitely the political strategy from Nancy Pelosi in this was well executed because, you know, people like the more progressive wing of the Democrats have been calling on her to start impeachment way earlier, but you can see this graph. She was obviously paying attention to this kind of polling. She's like, no, 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 no. We got to wait till we know we have a really good story. And then we'll push the narrative that we know we can win, or at least have a better chance of winning the narrative. And so that's honestly what this is all about, right? It's a it's a competing narrative issue, uh, and it's yeah. and it's all about how that narrative will play into the twenty twenty election. Right, right. That's a good point, you know. And I'm I'm looking down at at the next one, which is the one support for impeachment by party, where it actually shows support by by Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. And to me, this one's actually sort of fascinating, is because when the news about the Ukraine the Ukraine scandal snowballed. Actually, independents, Republicans and Democrats all actually saw a rise in support for impeachment, mm -hmm. which is which is which is like you were saying, this is an interesting time because for once there's actually a growing support for it. Obviously, Republicans are still down under 11 percent in support. But but what you're seeing is a large growth in independence right there actually is it's significant. Um, it, yeah. it, it is. Yeah. And though it is looking like it starting to stagnate. It is it is large and you're seeing growing independence support it. Now, I like I think you and I were talking about this a few days ago, is that what I'm still unclear on? I don't know if there's really much research out about it yet since these he new hearings were so recent. Um, I'm just confused if some of these moderates would actually be turned to vote against Trump in the next election or if they're just right now with public opinion because of what they're seeing, you know, and so I'm, I'm not sure in the long term if much is really going to change. And I would, to, to mention that, I would just cite an Economist article from this week that talks about how basically Trump has always recovered from every single other issue when it comes to controversy and his popularity. It's always been between 40 and 45 percent. And so to me, I find it very unlikely that much is going to change. I mean, because during all the controversy with Michael Flynn as national security advisor, and his failure of the first travel ban, he still remained. He bounced up to about 45%. And then during the, hit, the failure of trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act, he lost a little bit, but then gained it back with the tax cuts. Um, he lost a little bit with the government shutdown in 2018, 2019. And he still saw a small dip, but then it reset. 
And then, you know, with the Charlottesville comments about great people on both sides, he saw a small decrease, but then apparently it went up again. And The Economist says it's just because the public appears to have obviously processed these as partisan battles and they've re reacted accordingly. So I just don't see, based on that, that uh, 538 graph we we're looking at, I actually don't really know if I see this being any different. Because right now we're seeing that small little peak in support of impeaching him. But what's going to happen in two weeks, you know? Yeah, I mean, you can already see that, like, it's it's plateaued. Like, it's not increasing any more recently. Um, the the support for impeachment is kind of plateaued. So I think a lot of it's going to be based on these hearings. But then again, like you said, I mean, it, <laughs> we still have a year. We still have a year until the actual election, and a lot can happen, and a lot can happen that people forget about, right? I mean, the Mueller report was this earlier this year, and I feel like people already forgot about it. Um, you know, like, I, I think you're right. Unfortunately, you're right that the American public seems to, um, reset after every scandal with this president. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the media and the partisanship and, and the culture of the country as a whole. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, cause you know, there's a huge media machine that is in support of Trump. There's also a huge media machine that's very against Trump. Don't get me wrong as well. People are very entrenched in their corners and the media is definitely enhancing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see that like, you know, you had like, like, especially something like the Obamacare thing. That was a pretty big deal. I think in the 2016 election, that was a pretty big plank in Trump's um, campaign was repealing Obamacare and kind of repealing everything Obama did. The fact that he was unable to do that and there was a big kerfuffle about it and he still came back on top as far as popularity with his own base. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and, 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 you know, in a traditional sense of the word, like I'm amazed that that happened. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is quite amazing. I, you know, I am not a, not a huge fan of the guy, but I'm, I'm always appalled with how how well he's been able to recover from every incident. And I think I think it's because he's being insulated by the Republican Party, you know, and yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's just everything he does. There's silver lining to it, I think, in the Republican eyes. It's like, yes, he he's, you know, not not kept up with all of the things he said and he doesn't speak like a politician. And maybe he's a little corrupt, but aren't they all? I think that's the mindset. And, you know, and I think I mean, in these hearings this week, we, we really did see the usual, um, you know, Congressman Ratcliffe and. Uh, Congressman Jim Jordan, we saw them all roll up their sleeves and go out and kind of embarrass themselves again, you know, and it seems to be a trend is that Trump, I, I hate, I don't want to call him totally uh, invincible, but he seems to be in a spot that I, I'm worried this impeachment is just going to put us into the weeds. I really am. Yeah, people are going to get tired of it. I think I think that's also because I, I also heard that um, uh, Schiff is trying to go do go very quick. Because they know that, you know, Mueller's took forever. Um, people kind of forgot. The report was public. And then between the pu the, pu the report being public and the test testifying, there was months. It was just too long. And unfortunately, right, I mean, it's not like it's Mueller's fault. Like, he had to do an intensive investigation that went down so many rabbit holes. But as far as public perception, yeah, it gets in the weeds and people just forget or they don't care or they're like, you know, I don't even, I don't really, I can't really follow this anymore. I don't really know what's going on. And so I, yeah. I do know that as far as um, Democratic strategy, Schiff is trying to be as quick as possible. But we're already, yeah, we're already, you know, we're one week into the hearings. We're a couple, well, like a month and a half into the scandal itself. It's got to be wrapped up by Christmas. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, it's got to be wrapped up by Christmas. And um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's such an interesting time. Um, yeah. And it really is a narrative battle. Um, I do think, I mean... Look, obviously, the Republicans have a, a right and a duty to question uh, witnesses and, you know, inquire about if they have potential bias or anything like that. But I saw some of those like like they put up these signs that were up in the back and it, and there was it was so cheesy, like, you know, getting their interns to print out these massive signs that said, like, no quid pro quo. It was just like, I don't know, it was obvious. It was obviously just like a, a circus kind of show. Yeah, they I think you're right, you know, and it does seem like they are slowly running out of stable arguments. Uh, I I think they're still holding well on to intent. And I think if they play it right, 
they could maybe go somewhere with them. But every day the president tweets and every day that uh, this goes on and another person talks, it, it just doesn't look good, you know. Um, and I, I wanted to go back really quickly to corruption in Ukraine because you, you touched well on it. And I think you had a really good point about Trump not caring about corruption. And I, I just wanted to highlight that um, because, you know, like I was saying earlier, I, I think this all comes down to Trump's intent. Was it to actually stop corruption in Ukraine or was it to, uh, you know, investigate Hunter Biden? And I think two things can be true again at once in this. I, I think that maybe Trump saw it as a good cover to say that they were investigating corruption. But I find it very unlikely that in a country that's pretty corrupt, the only company they wanted to invest was one that the Bidens had a connection to. And I just wanted to go over real quick two two laws that Trump um, uh, vetoed last year, which shows he was not anti-corruption. Uh, and this is reported by Ayesha Resco from the, uh, the NPR White House reporter. And she said the Securities and Exchange Commission had used a rule that would have required oil and gas companies to disclose any payments they made to governments around the world. The rule was really aimed at preventing bribery, which is an issue for oil and gas companies. But big oil companies were not were not a fan of this regulation, and Trump signed a law rescinding the rule. After that rule was rescinded, the Trump administration followed that up by pulling the U.S. out of this international effort to set a global standard for transparency in oil and gas resource management. This is known as the ex ex Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. But somehow, ironically, Ukraine is actually still a part of this initiative, even though the U.S. is not. And so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's like, obviously, he doesn't, like you said, care about corruption. And foreign policy even reports that U Ukraine isn't as corrupt as people uh, think it is. People tend to overstate the amount of corruption in the country. Mm. Um, and foreign policy used the measurements from the Transpar Transparency International's 2018 ranking, the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business ranking, and then public opinion surveys. And all of them found Ukraine about in the middle of the world in forms of uh, corruption. And they'd improved quite dramatically since 2014. Right. Um, public opinion polls were the only ones that saw Ukraine actually being corrupt, which was interesting. So it shows that people still have a negative view in Ukraine, but at the same time, things are actually getting better. So I, I think that if Trump was trying to investigate uh, corruption, Ukraine probably wasn't the 101 spot. You know what I mean? And, and then again, right. If, if the, exactly like everything you said makes so much sense. And then also on top of that, what, what, if you really wanted to investigate corruption in Ukraine, why not go through the regular diplomatic channels? Right. Yeah. It's and 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 look to the who's who's one of the best resources on anti corruption and fought her whole life against corruption was Marie Yovanovitch. And <laughs> and they were the one that they was she trying to oust her. So yeah, I don't buy the story that he was trying to get uh, against corruption in general. I think he was going against the Bidens. Now, let's be clear too, I mean I, I do think it's kinda of sketch that Hunter Biden was on that board of that energy company. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Um I Especially since a lot of it was just like they wanted an American name to make them look good. Um, but like, again, like we, you know, kind of the theme of this episode is two things can be true at once. It, it could be true that it might have been a little unethical or a little bit of like privileged positioning that Hunter Biden was on that board of that energy company. And that could have been, yeah, looked at negatively. It also is true that going to find that out and get dirt. And to utilize that for political gain is an impeachable offense. So, like, you know, I, I, I think I think you and I are kind of on the same page that, like, there's there's two conflicting narratives going on from Democrats and Republicans. And there's kind of like both both parts of both can still be true. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good way to put it. Because it's it's true. And see, it's just my issue is that if two things can be right at once then I'm not sure if Trump actually, I mean, I mean, we've talked about this. I don't see Trump getting removed either way, but it, I, I find it would be hard to actually do anything with him in the Senate, even if it was a more evenly split vote in there, just because when two things are right at once, it's very hard to convict. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, true. Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. Cause pe people like the black and white narrative, you know what I mean? Um, and that's why both sides are pushing it so hard when it's a good guy and a bad guy. Um, right. But, you know, I do I do have to say the good guys in this in this scenario to me are the uh, you know foreign policy professionals that have now had to come out in hearings and get attacked on Twitter and everything and have their reputations 
you know, possibly tarnished by some people. So I have to say, you know, I have to give I have to give credit where credit's due. To the, it's not easy what some of these people are going through, um, like Taylor and Kent and Yovanovitch and Sondland even, you know, even though he's part of kind of implicated on the stuff, you know, he's been cooperative and it seems like he, he didn't really understand everything he was getting into as well. Um, so we'll have to see, man. Uh, but I do think that it is kind of a, it's kind of a disgraceful time when you have people that are like lifelong servants of the, of us interests and they're getting attacked on Twitter that like, you know, Marie Yovanovitch was like, oh, the whole situation in Somalia was bad. And she, while she was there, it's like, dad, dude, that's so, that's so unfortunate for her. I don't know. Like, a, you build yeah. your whole career on a reputation, and then the president just smears you in a tweet while you're testifying. That kind of sucks. Now, I, I don't think it was witness tampering. That's another thing Democrats are crying foul over is Don, Donald Trump tweeted against Yovanovitch while she was testifying, and they're saying that's witness tampering. The reality is it's not like Yovanovitch was on her phone in her hearing. She would not have known about the tweets unless if Schiff did not say anything. So I don't consider that like witness tampering, but it's definitely unprofessional and tacky. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. Unprofessional and tacky, you know? Uh, and I'm glad you brought up that because, because I, I think that's the, the crucial point why I still think that it's good. We're having these open hearings and these televised hearings and this discussion is because to me, the accusations of a quid pro quo and now I guess potentially bribery and extortion against Trump, I think they're going to be difficult to fight, but I think the bigger issue at hand are the actions of the president, you know, the moral actions of the president. Mm -hmm. And I think these testimonies one way or another are at least going to let the American people see that he's kind of an a-hole, yeah. um, which I, th which I think a lot of people already have made up their mind about, but these testimonies, these testimonies echo the same worries that the Mueller report had. Trump is just a morally unfit man who at best struggles with the truth. And I doubt this quid pro quo is going to get him removed, but I hope it tells people that he should not be at the forefront of our international affairs. And it's I, it, it just horrifies me. And yeah, the, the Marie Yovanovitch uh, hearing on Friday, I thought it was more powerful just because you saw a career ambassador, a career diplomat who also was from Ukrainian migrant parents who lived without a nation for a lot of her youth. To, to see her just getting just, pulled apart by the president who is just such a morally lacking man, I think is disgusting. And I think that's, it showed about how dirty he wants to get, you know? And I mean, I would argue Schiff is also not probably just Mr. Perfect. You know, I, he, he brought that up. It's clear that they want, right. um, they, they wanted, wanted yeah. Trump to say that. Right. Right. No, as soon as he saw, he saw the tweets, he's like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it up in the, in the hearing. It's just like, all right, man, that's, yeah, it's kind of dirty too, but no, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've, it's it, that's another thing too. Even with the Mueller uh, hearings and these hearings, it's so obvious the difference in like work culture between congressmen and women and actual like you know diplomats and ambassadors and like the more nonpartisan uh, fa uh, workers in federal government. Like how more professional and less emotional uh, the professionals are, and then how like bombastic <laughs> and uh, grandstanding the congressmen and women can be it's so it's such a stark contrast but um and it's kind of unfortunate but it's just a it's just a political landscape we live in like you know you get a one minute to ask questions and most of the time democrat or republican they use it to grandstand and like do a long wind, <laughs> a long-winded leading question that makes them look good for a soundbite that they can replay on msnbc oh my gosh <laughs> dude it's tiring it is tiring that's another thing too i want to talk about is like Watching these hearings is the fact that uh, most people, including myself, I mean, I just I just didn't have the time, don't have the time or effort to get through a five and a half hour hearing. Most people watch part of it and then get analysis from their sources. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm included in that. So I don't want to I, I don't want to sound hypocritical, but it's just interesting that like um, that's the world we live in now is it's, it's hard for everyone to get the uh, hearing from the source and everyone kind of goes to their sources and that's dangerous. That's, that's a really good point. And that, that goes back to that tale of two stories, you know, it's, right. it's really easy to believe whatever you want when you see you have Tucker Carlson on one side 
you know, calling out Maria Yovanovic and saying that these are, you know, boring and sleep causing. And then on CNN, you know, it's a bombshell that, right. um, you know, we might as well just vote on impeachment right now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, you know? And I, I, I actually, I, I don't know if I've said it on the show, I'm sure I've said it to you, is that I, I think the media on both sides is responsible for what's happened with Trump. You know, you can, you can say Fox News is an echo chamber for Trump and Trump supporters, but you know, CNN's made him a star. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of people are, they might not even like Trump or like Fox News, but they might just be dis- disillusioned with how much of a celebrity the left has made him. You know, they it, like the left-wing media talks about him day in and day out. And I, I think people are kind of sick of it. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, it, the, the media is no doubt a huge part in this whole entrenched political culture we live in. I mean, like, like, you know, comparing back to like the Nixon, um, the, you know, the Nixon almost impeachment was like, you know, <laughs> back then people only had like four channels and you would yeah. everyone would get their news from Walter Cronkite. Right. It was a very it was way less of a partisan media landscape. So when, you know, when some when something happened, right, when the when the, the, the frost tapes, you know, came out or whatever, everyone heard from the same story and the same source or at least one of three but now, you know, with the internet and clickbait and the culture and like everything we've talked about, how you have cable news channels that feed and make money off of partisanship. It's a, it's, I, we're, it's just such a different landscape that I don't think we're ever going to have a Nixon style coming to terms with something again. Right? Nixon was so bad that even Republicans, everyone, everyone in the country was like, okay, yeah, this guy's got to, like, this guy's got to go. And even Nixon was like, all right, I got to go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But I don't think we're ever going to see that again. No, you're, you're correct. I mean, we are truly living in almost a parallel time to that time. Like, everything looks the same on paper. We still have the same two parties, but boy, are we in almost like a, a Twilight Zone version of it. I mean, there is no way anything would happen, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, it's funny. You, you talk about, you know, views for this and and in kind of the media's role and i mean axios reports that actually these day one's impeachment inquiry uh with with taylor and kent actually fell shy of comey's testimony by over six million viewers the blasey ford brett kavanaugh hearing and the michael cohen hearing so actually less people 13 million live viewers watched day one's testimony um and that was compared to 20 million for Kavanaugh, 16 million for Cohen and uh, 19 million for Comey's. And so I, I think it's fatigue. It also could be the fact that it's in the middle of the day. So working people are probably not going to watch it. Right. But I I do think it kind of shows that people are tired. People are tired of this. And I mean, I'm one of the people personally that says at this point, let's wait for the election. I know there's a precedent that we don't want to ruin. And I know that Trump He's he's leading with an awful example, but at this point, I I mean, it's a year away. I just don't know how much damage can be done, except for maybe just pissing off average people. Yeah, no, that's true, and I, I, I definitely personally feel the fatigue as well. Like I, you know, I I watched way more of the Kavanaugh stuff than I watched of these hearings. You know, I had to I've had to go to my own now, like you know, various analysis and and synopsis and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's just so hard. It's so hard to pay so all all my effort and attention to a five hour hearing when, like, you know, I got a life to live. I got other things I got to do. Yeah. Um. And we and again, like, like we said at the beginning of this episode, it feels like we're in round two or round five now. <laughs> and again, like I I personally think these are rounds. You know, these are rounds of boxing that are worth boxing. But it there's definitely going to be fatigue on all sides. Yeah, I, I yeah, and it's an interesting time. I wonder how much of this um will will bleed over into the next year, but based on everything we've talked about today and the statistics you've pulled up, it looks like it looks like Trump's just going to bounce back in a couple months. Yeah, unfortunately, you're correct. I, I think obviously we shall see, yeah, but, we, we uh, can't predict the future, but yeah. I mean, I I do I've heard some commentators um on the right uh, more moderates, kind of the, I guess, as Trump would say, the never Trumpers, like David Brooks, who I'm a, I'm a big fan of. Mm-hmm. And, and, he, and he thinks that Sondland could technically be some form of a smoking gun, uh, which I don't like using that terminology because, I, like you said, the Nixon time was much different. Um, Trump arguably could have had like six or seven smoking guns that no one gives a crap about. Right. Um, but it, it is interesting because Sondland clearly changed his first story. Yeah. Um, and now 
I think I think he's seen what happens to Trump people that get in trouble with the law. You know, Cohen Manafort Stone. Yes. Stone just got indicted. What on Friday? Yeah. And uh, on all I, counts. I think, uh, yeah, on all counts. And so this is what happens with people that lie for Trump. And uh, I think Sondland, is, he seems like a smart man. He's obviously a wealthy Republican donor who actually did not support Trump until right before the election. They actually had kind of a rocky relationship. So I don't see this guy as someone who's going to fall on the sword for Trump. And I rather think it could be fascinating that he's going to testify. I think it's next Wednesday. Yeah, Um, because he's someone that had firsthand information. And this kind of would get rid of the Republican argument. This is all secondhand sources. If Sondland testifies, this is a direct source. Right. Uh, Yeah. That's true. That's true. I mean, gosh, I mean, you're definitely right. Like Trump may Trump may be invincible, but his henchmen certainly aren't. As no. we've seen a lot of them go to jail. <laughs> um, yeah, including oh, Roger Stone, man. Roger Stone. Speaking back to Nixon, <laughs> another connection to Nixon is this Roger Stone. <laughs> he is. He is. He is now probably. I think he's probably going to go to jail for the rest of his life, which is only going to be like 15 years, but. I think he's going to go to jail for the rest of his life because he's he's on he got he got uh, guilty on seven different counts of what was it like ext- uh, extortion witness tampering and bribery or yeah and yeah and, and he was also and lying lying, <laughs> lying yeah and lying bro yeah that's a you're over <laughs> yeah I mean I mean honestly side note with Roger Stone uh, I don't know if I think it's called Get Me Roger Stone Netflix documentary yes that. I, I mean, honestly, the guy seemed like a, I mean, kind of as a genius in some ways. I mean, he argued like him and Manafort arguably created modern day lobbying. Yes. He so did. these are guys that, yeah, they, I mean, these are guys that truly understand how to use the system. So I'm, I think it was almost like their time had about come by the end of this, you know? Yeah. I think they, I think they just bet. I just think they just bet on a risky horse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Hey, really fast before before we slowly start wrapping up the, this impeachment talk, I, I something we haven't covered today that I, I do want to know your opinion on is uh, the Wall Street. Or sorry, sorry, not the Wall Street. The Washington Post reported that the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee recently conducted focus groups to determine which description sounds most damning to voters involving what to call this, and they found that bribery and extortion were better used to describe Trump's actions. Yeah. And at first, I have to say, I was reading about this a little bit, and at first I thought, you know, it's, it's kind of shady because you're, you're now trying to simplify it, but also maybe go overboard because quid pro quo is technically not illegal, but bribery and extortion are impeachable offenses. And so at first I was kind of against this, but reading up on it, I, I actually could kind of see that these events with Zelensky and the phone call, if we get enough evidence could be worse than a quid pro quo. And I think there is an argument to say it was more than just a quid pro quo going into extortion and bribery, because this wasn't just a transactional idea. It was actually wrongdoing that could have harmed the Ukrainian people um, unless there was dirt on a political rival. And um, I think it was reported that Zelensky was going to go on to Fareed Zakaria's show and announce this investigation until all this hit the fan on September 12th. And so I think this shows this, this was a guy who had no choice but to do it, which could go on just, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Right. You know? Right. Well, I mean, you know, Ukraine is pretty dependent on um, military aid to fight off because they're, they are currently facing a war on their Eastern front in the Ukraine against Russian separatists, which, you know, uh, on a paper are just a rogue group but I think anyone with half a brain knows that Russia is definitely supporting the the separatists in the east, you know, with with weapons and whatever else, logistical help. Um, same thing with Crimea, right? It wasn't just a rogue group. I think it was definitely coordinated by Russia. Um, so yeah, and Ukraine's a Ukraine Ukraine is a David versus a Goliath, and so the United States has been r- supplying hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid that Ukraine needs. They you know not just wants, but like needs. And I think that that it's the, it's the imbalance in power that is making this more of a, an extortion than a hey maybe you can just maybe help me out where it's like a no you need like you need to do this or else you're not going to get the military aid you need to be, remain an independent state. Um, I, I as far as the democratic strategy, I think it's smart. It's a I mean it's a little shady, but I think that's. Everyone does focus groups and, and <laughs> everyone does focus groups to figure out a narrative. You know, that's nothing yeah. that's nothing new. And I think it is smart because, you know, the average American doesn't 
know what a quid pro quo is. And I, I heard that same thing that you just mentioned on, on NPR and the guy on NPR was basically like, people don't know Latin. People don't want to hear Latin. People want to hear everyday American words and bribe is something that everyone understands. Everyone knows what a bribe is, you know? So I think it was, I think it's a smart strategic point is get rid of the quid pro quo, especially since Trump and his narrative was so quick to be no quid pro quo, hammered that home, not a single quid pro quo, right? Say that a billion times. So the Democrats, I think, were smart to just be like, all right, fine, we'll call it bribery. We'll call it extortion. <laughs> and that translates Fair better, point. yeah. Fair point, you know? And and yeah, like you said, I, I, I think that, like, see, if like if they keep it at quid pro quo, it, it's easy for the Republicans to say, well, it happens in diplomacy all the time. And then they can turn it back to this abstract foreign policy right. argument over what is the U.S. role and can the president as the chief diplomat do this? But now if you switch quid pro quo with extortion and bribery, it, it sounds a lot more shady and it's impeachable. I don't think quid pro quos are technically impeachable, you know? Right. Again, it's the – like what you said, it, it, quid pro quos are impeachable if it's the intent. Bribery yeah. and extortion, regardless of intent, are impeachable. So, yeah, it is a shift. It's kind of shifting the goalposts. Um, a little bit, but if that's where, but if that's where the soccer ball lands, then that's where it <laughs> lands. We'll have to see. But um, yeah, I do think it's an interesting strategy change as far as the language. But it go just goes to show how important language and rhetoric is in driving a narrative to support public opinion. Yes, I I full heartedly agree. I don't know any any last thoughts on this uh, growing impeachment obviously we're probably going to be covering this a lot more i'd assume yeah yeah it'll kind of be like a, a like a check in kind of thing even though we, when we cover other topics we'll probably have to check in on this but speaking of public opinion um <laughs> there is you know there's a narratives there are two conflicting narratives regarding evo morales in bolivia we do like to cover things in latin america on this podcast it's fascinating and interesting and recently Evo Morales, the head, uh, he was the president, right? Or the yes. Senate president? Yeah, presidential term. He just mm -hmm. recently had to step down from being president uh, on November 10th after 13 years of being the president of Bolivia. Do you want to? Do you want to kind of give some background or maybe some info on what's going on down there, Alex? Yeah, I mean, so so basically, what happened is Mr. Morales actually was a very historic figure for Bol for Bolivia um, because he was Aymara, which is one of the subjugated indigenous groups from Bolivia. Um, I don't know if people could picture it, but it's the group that has rainbow painted flags that are a big symbol of a lot of uh, South America now, but it's the Aymaras that are from the kind of Altiplano high region of Bolivia, treated horribly by the conquistadors when they came. And so it was large large that Mr. Morales won because he was an indigenous man to finally represent a uh, mainly indigenous country in South America. And he was really positive at first. He imposed the new constitution, which limited presidents to two terms. Um, and thanks to the commodity boom and his pragmatic economics, uh, poverty fell. He also tried to create a more inclusive society, mainly for indigenous people with the mestizos. But the problem was over time, uh, he was ruthless with opponents. And then he made the classic strongman's mistake of losing touch with his voters. And in 2016, he narrowly lost a referendum to abolish presidential term limits. Um, but he got the constitutional court to say that he could run for a third term anyway. And then this caused a pretty large uprising in which last week the military finally was able to talk Morales into resignation, in which he is now on exile in Mexico. And the big issue is, is that um, a lot of people on the left, even in Europe, are claiming this was a military coup, while as more moderates of people on the right are claiming this was a revolution and it was necessary. And again, actually, Drew, this ties in well to what we were talking about earlier, because sometimes two things can be right. Right. And um, it seems like there was a little bit of both here. The military did tuck Morales out of power. Um, and so a lot of people think of coup as being a dark word in Latin America, you know, from the thirties into the eighties, there was a lot of violent overthrows of civilian governments. And so people don't like the word coup. And I think revolution is a more positive term. It's seen as kind of a romanticized change of government, but in reality, I think both things are happening and it's less important about the coup or the revolution, but what happens next, you know? Yeah. So, um, 
I think yeah, I think you definitely did a great synopsis. I want to give a little more uh, context on the on who thinks it's a coup officially right now is um, the 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 states that consider this a coup and not legitimate are Mexico, Cuba, Uruguay, Nicaragua, the Maduro, you know uh, Venezuela, the Maduro part of Venezuela because that's kind of in dispute, um, and then our, and then our, uh, the president elect of Argentina considers this a coup, um, and. I think, and there's often talk of you know U.S. influence or U.S. wanting this to happen. I don't, I don't doubt that the U.S. wanted Morales gone. I mean, this guy has talked openly about communitarian socialism. He's been pro Chavez. Um, you know, basically, the, the, he's been the, basically the kind of thing that the Americans don't want in Latin America, <laughs> which is yeah. a very socialist, anti, anti globalist, anti uh, colonial. Um, vibe basically <laughs> um, but yeah I mean and so I don't doubt that the US is happy that he's gone um, but what 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 gets me is the fact that he he wanted to change the Constitution to allow him to have extra terms um, you know that just that's just so dangerous even when you have someone that may be beloved and you know a, a, a triumph of indigenous peoples right and, and changes the country forever you start to get to that point where he's changing the constitution to get more terms. Now you're down the road of a dictator. Um, and so to, to me, it's like, you know, again, I'm not super well-versed in Bolivian politics and evil morales and stuff. Um, but I, I do think that he, he was going down the strong man route and he was buddy. Uh, he was buddy, buddy with some sketchy people like Maduro in Venezuela, um, like the Ayatollah in Iran, very anti-West figures. And so, you know, as someone from the West, <laughs> you know, you get a little nervous. You get a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's definitely fair, you know. And I, I mean, I, I think it's true. You know, the road to, he to hell is paved on good intentions. And yeah. unfortunately, it seems to be a trend in this part of the world is that you get a lot of these it, more in the late 90s and now the 21st century is you've got a lot of guys that grew up in either indigenous um, military or very anti-colonialism. You know, obviously by seeing the impact it's had on right. the poor people in Latin America. And so you've had these guys where they've, they've come up with good intentions to basically provide an alternative to their people. But unfortunately, it's, it's a globalist world, as we've talked about. And it's quite truly impossible to run kind of a socialist counter uh, capitalist regime in a part of the world that relies on exports. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> that's... it's... It, it's 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 quite a an issue man and and like so my big issue is you know i think it's wrong to call this a coup in this case because like you said he he made the issue of losing touch with his voters and then trying to hold on to power and as we've seen in history usually that's not a good thing and uh now we're just in an issue where it's easy to just label each other as the other oh you're the you know revolutionaries or oh you're the military this but to me it's just dangerous rhetoric of pointing a finger i don't really give a damn if it's a coup or a revolution but it's like now it's this thing they call the Schrodinger's paradox, um, the Schrodinger's coup by the Aust Austrian physicist Erwin Schrodinger, who says that after things like this, their states begin to exist in a perpetual state of ambiguity, simultaneously coup and not coup, with no f uh, hope of forcing the events into a single clear category. Mm. And so, like, it's it's easy to just get in this kind of conundrum of pointing fingers and having these changes. But I mean, in reality. I think I think they just need to hold open elections and try to move forward instead of divide the country over this. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens now, because now there are protests calling for him to be returned in which a few people have actually died. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we're getting to the point now where there's violence in the streets. And, you know, we're <laughs> we talked about um, Chile a couple of weeks ago. And now we're seeing it pop up in Bolivia. And one, you know, it's because in the late 90s, early 2000s, you had this pink tide, right? Which was all these figures like Morales, like Hugo Chavez, as their, their counter reaction um, to the neoliberal world, right? And at first it was highly popular. I think now the pink tide, right? The waves have kind of died down and we're starting to see the cracks in the armor. And, hmm. you know, we're seeing. We're seeing some people being upset, right, with like the neoliberal world, but then some people in Venezuela being like this, this commu you know, communitarian socialism thing that you're trying out is leading to bread lines and people leaving Venezuela in max exodus. 
Um, and so it's interesting to see Bolivia kind of in between the two. And and now Evo, with Evo gone, I hope someone comes in that um, continue Because Evo definitely, it, it's obvious that Evo, for a while, truly cared about the Bolivian people, right? Because he, mm-hmm. he was an indigenous guy. He was, he was out in the trenches with them. So I hope that the next person has that same kind of thing, but also, you know, doesn't try to change the constitution to, to ma- maintain power. I think, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. And to be a little bit more open to the world and, um, and maybe a little less friendly with Iran and Venezuela because I, th- and Venezuela is going down the drain. So I don't know. We'll see. It's so strange, but that's, that's, that's a good point. You know, it, it, it really does seem like they're kind of in the middle of this. And, and unfortunately now they have, you know, Mexico protecting Morales and you probably have the U S are going to, you know, to help prop up this interim president, what's her name is, I think Gian, Gianine Agnes. I'm probably butchering that, but it, it, to me just unfortunately seems like another quagmire in the region, you know? Uh, and there, I, I have over social media and on a few news sites seen that there are people criticizing this interim president as being pretty white right wing. And some people are worried that they might try to get rid of even the good policies that Morales has done. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, to me, it unfortunately seems like this continuing issue in a lot of Latin America, you know, is you have one leftist party and then you have a right wing party that tries to kind of erase it. And it's just back and forth, you know, the old push and pull. <laughs> the old push and pull right. but it's interesting we'll have to keep people up on it i i don't know i like you said I, i'm not i'm also not too versed in bolivian politics but i know in the late 90s early thousands they had huge water shortages after um bolivia was privatizing water um a, a lot of issues with that a lot of indigenous people suffering and so you know i i think evo morales was necessary i think he embodied people that had never had a voice before i think that's true i think that's true Again, like like the whole theme of the episode, two things can be true at once. It's true that Evo Morales probably, you know, brought a lot of people up and was a good thing for Bolivia for a decade. And then it could also be true that it started to go down the strong man route and started abusing power or, or trying to abuse it. And he he ruined his shot and he'll probably get remembered for this. <laughs> yeah. History's tough, man. It's, it's tough on you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it always depends on who writes it, right? I agree. Well, yeah, we'll have to keep people up to up to date on these both these issues. There's too much to cover. Uh, but I mean, I think this goes back to what we were talking about the last two two episodes is there's a pressing uh, seems to be a pressing change in the neoliberal paradigm. Right. There's a lot of there's a lot of shifting happening, the shifting sands of the world. Yep. And a lot of uh, new new players too, new players and old players re- re- reviving. Exactly. Well, I think that'll have to do it for this episode of the Tonic Accord podcast. Um, again, you can find us on uh, Facebook, YouTube, Podbean, Apple Podcasts. Um, and where am I missing? Instagram. Uh, but yeah, it, honestly, just Google a Tonic Accord. Uh, especially, uh, we encourage you to definitely download the podcast. You, know, you can, you can you know, drive around with it, listen to it offline, do whatever you want with it. We also encourage you guys to give feedback and comments. We definitely want to hear from anything you have to say about the podcast or any of the topics we discussed um this is open discussion kind of thing and we'd love to hear from you